Good morning, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Cheers. I have coffee. I hope you have your coffee with you because I do. Ooh. Welcome. Yes. I know we're going to have a great <laughs> today. Welcome to Baby League's Mommy and Me Live. This is our online chat about all things mommyhood, and it's a free and safe space where we just want to get together and conversate and commiserate about all things motherhood. Today, we are talking about sleep environment. I'm Jill Simonian, by the way. Hi, should have said that before. I guess I need more coffee, but we'll deal with that later. We're talking about sleep environment today, and we're going to be talking about the trials and tribulations and all things about how to set your baby, toddler, child up for good sleep in the environment that they like to take their Z's in. And we, um, we're very lucky that this episode, if you will, is sponsored by Busey and Marpac and ding, 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 ding. Here's the best part of it. There is a huge, huge giveaway by Motorola towards the mm, middle of the show, but we're going to have the actual giveaway at the end of the show, so you're going to want to stay tuned and take part for that giveaway. It's a really good one. Today, joining us, a fabulous panel like we always have, we have our resident expert who I like to refer to as the sleep diva. And her <laughs> sleep diva, Jenny June, she is going to legitimize herself and take the title beyond sleep diva because she does have a true title. Jenny, hi, how are you? Tell us who you are and legitimize the title. <laughs> <laughs> hi, Jill. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Jenny June. I am a mother of four. Uh, my children are 21, 19, 17, and 14. Uh, and uh, I'm a duly certified child sleep consultant and family sleep consultant uh, with a uh, 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 just a, a background in pediatric sleep hygiene, and I'm also a nationally certified child uh, or a certified uh, lactation counselor as well. So, um, you know, I bring in all components of sleep wellness and health and safety for children, and, and we're going to be talking a lot about the sleep environment, which is a really important component of my four pillars of sleep hygiene. Sleep hygiene is just uh, well sleep for children. It's syncing their, their sleep with their natural biological rhythms and doing everything we can to kickstart and elevate melatonin production uh, for sleep, uh, making the job really easy and without even having to use a method even at, at that point. Uh, but the sleep environment is number one in, uh, in that pillar, um, elevating those melatonin levels. So we're going to get to that. Very good. Lots of stuff, lots of sleep environment, lots of melatonin. I'm feeling the melatonin <laughs> now. Uh, going down the panel, I was going to go down the little line here at the bottom of the thing. Uh, Jill, this is the J show. We do have all J's on the panel today. But there is another Jill, and I'm so excited. And Jill and I know each other, so I'm excited that she's going to be on this panel chat. Jill, introduce to us who you are. Hi, I'm so happy to be here. Jill, you and I have talked about being able to like be on TV or host something <laughs> together, so this is a lot of fun. Um, so, um, my name is Jill Cordes, and I have a background in TV, kind of like you, Jill. Uh, I was a TV news reporter and then hosted a show on Food Network for six years, and then HGTV, and was married for 11 years before we decided to have kids. I actually didn't think I ever wanted kids. and. Oh, I'm so glad I did not go through with the decision of not wanting them. Um, I did become a <laughs> mom at the age of 39. Um, luckily, I had no problems getting pregnant. And then another a second, my second baby came when I was 42, sort of unexpectedly, because who thinks you can get pregnant that easily at 42? And um, I so now I have a three and a five year old. And I blogged for about four years for Parents Magazine under the title Fearless Feisty Mama, and I've kind of moved that off onto my own blog now that needs to be updated because I have not had a chance <laughs> between my three and five year old and my vacuum cleaner to write <laughs> lately. But one of the biggest things for me when I first had my daughter five years ago was sleep because I nearly lost my mind in the beginning and mm -hmm. I've always been a huge protector of my sleep. So uh, I, you know, I'll talk more about it on the show, but w the first time around I was going crazy and I did some sleep training very early on. The second time with my son I was a little more indulgent and I had a night nurse and I kind of carried it on too long, probably, until I finally bit the bullet and sleep trained him. Now we are a happily sleeping family for the most part, although we do have musical beds going on a lot. So I'm very curious to talk to Jenny June about, you know, what repercussions I can face um, <laughs> until they're teenagers and want nothing to do with me. And Jenny, and Jenny will school you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's right. Get them out of your bed. She won't. She won't. She won't. She won't. This is, like I said, this is a safe place. And before I introduce our next panelist, 
quick reminder to everyone watching, we do want you to enter your questions on the right side of your screen because this on the right side of your screen because this is a conversation for everyone. So enter your questions and I'm going to introduce the next J girl on the panel. Jenica, tell us who you are and where we can find you. Hi, yeah, I'm Jenica Anderson and I'm currently in Utah. Um, me and my husband have a family vlog, a daily vlog that we have on YouTube called Samica Vlogs, where we just film our everyday life and People like to watch it randomly. So <laughs> that's been fun. And then we also work with a clothing company called Trixon. So it's been good. I have sorry, I have a ten month old. He yes. takes ten months next week. Um, sleep was a challenge for us. So this will be fun to talk about because I tried sleep training multiple times but ended up just waiting until he was ready. So we're finally sleeping through the night. Um, and it's been going well. So we get twelve hours, which is good. Hey! hey. Yeah. 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 Yes. Okay, well I have a three and four year old, three and four and a half year old, so I forgot to say that before. But let's jump right into the questions. We're all at sort of varied experience levels, so to speak. We have a baby, we have toddlers, and then Jenny June, of course, you're the expert. So I'm going to jump into the question first for Jenny. Uh, question from Small Wonder, what's the safest temperature for my baby's room? With summer coming up, we haven't, uh, excuse me, with summer coming up, we have a wall unit air conditioner that makes a lot of noise, but without it, the room gets very, very humid. What's the best way to resolve this? Because uh, sleep temperature, I imagine, is a big part of the sleep environment. Jenny, what do you think? It is. It's a very important part. Great question. Um, the, the, the answer is what we've narrowed down in sleep science is that anywhere between 68 and 71 degrees Fahrenheit is the optimum temperature for sleep. Uh, you know, and, and you mentioned you have a wall air conditioner. It, you know, as long as it's a pure ambient sound and it's constant throughout the night, that could be your, you know, the way that you condition the stimulating sounds coming from outside of your child's bedroom window or their bedroom door. So that could be a positive in your situation if it's a, if it's a constant sound and it's pure ambient sound that doesn't have any rhythms or beats or waves or pulses. Uh, that's the ideal kind of white noise that we want to be using and we're probably going to talk more about that later. But the temperature, keeping it cooler is important because it helps uh, the, the child regulate their body temperature. And we know that, you know, about 60% of SIDS cases out there are directly related to a baby being overheated. So it, it's a safety issue to keep that temperature in the room nice and cool. And, uh, you know, just make sure your child has a full arm, full footy pajama and maybe, you know, a wearable blanket or something like that over the top of it. And, and it'll help, uh, you know, thin layers, cotton breathable layers will help the baby uh, regulate their body temperature best in, in that temperature. Say that again. Did you say 68 degrees? 68 to 71 degrees Fahrenheit. 68 to 71 degrees. That's interesting. Yeah. I'm curious, Jenica, you and I asked this following question because when my girls were babies, my husband was obsessed with keeping the heater on, saying that the room had to be warm because they were babies, and it was this, it was like he and I were having our own arguments in the middle of the night about the temperature. <laughs> Jenica, do you yeah. have to deal with? How do you regulate? Sleep okay. temperature with your baby. Are yeah. there arguments at home? Do, are you convinced <laughs> it's cold or what? It's funny because I was probably more like your husband, thinking it was too cold. <laughs> but we t that with now we since we have an air like a wall unit, we kind of just um, keep it between like 69 or 70 every night. Sometimes I just make it 71 because I like don't want him to get cold. And we have a humidifier and things, so I feel like his room is a little bit cooler anyway. Um, so it was kind of, we never really argued about it, but I kind of always worried, like, oh, I would, like, go in and check in, like, when he was little, like, is he too hot, is he too cold, <laughs> you know? But now I think we finally nailed it because we're around that exact area, and it's been working for us, so. Mm -hmm. Very good. good. Well, you're a better woman than I am. I will argue in the middle of the night no matter what, and this probably doesn't do anyone any favors. But I want to jump to our next question. Dee Dee asks, how much light... As a night light, should I be letting in from the hallway? Oh, this is a good one. This is relevant for, I think, a lot of us out there. My toddler yeah. likes the hallway light more than the actual night light, and I feel like it's way too bright for him. What do you do with that? Is a night light good? Is hallway light good? How much light do you let in the room? Jenny? You know, and that's the second component of the environment that's really, really important for babies in order for them to sleep better, and toddlers too. We need it really dark in that room. Um, I'm talking like a Vegas hotel room dark. You know how you go to Vegas and you play and you know you're you're exhausted, you finally roll up in your room and crash and you wake up and 
those blackout drapes work so good. You don't know if it's 12 noon or 12 midnight. Yeah, yeah. Um, some of us say we get our best sleep in Vegas for that reason. And <laughs> you know, t science the only reason is the curtains, not the alcohol. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, probably. I, you know, and the reason for that on a scientific basis is because between each of our sleep cycles, we're all awake for about one to three minutes, approximately. We just don't know that we are, and it's a very light, active stage of sleep. Um, in that stage, babies are very sensitive. Uh, so you know, they'll they'll make noises, they'll cry, sometimes they'll even sit up in that state, uh, but they always open their eyes. And when they do, if their eye gate catches even the slightest glimmer of light. Um, from a night light or maybe the, the drapes and the blinds are closed but you can see cracks of light from you know the summer evening you know sun um, it will stimulate a child all the way awake which will fragment their sleep it'll make it harder for them to get from one sleep cycle to the next so it's really important actually that we have that room as dark as possible um, you know we with toddlers and preschoolers there's often that fear of oh, well I think my child will be afraid of the dark or they're telling me they're afraid of the dark um, that's a big issue you know and when they learn that that your eyeballs get wide when they say that they play on it a lot too and they don't realize that you know that that's ultimately going to just exasperate the situation where they're not sleeping well so we always want to validate our children when they say they're afraid of something or whatnot so you know validate that experience talk about how the feeling of fear is normal um, and give them some tools to use that maybe don't include light um, that will help them soothe themselves if they're having that normal feeling uh, but don't legitimize what it is that they're afraid of especially if it's not something legitimately to be feared you know and sometimes we inadvertently legitimize fear of the dark by providing light you know we're like giving them telling them inadvertently that yeah it is something to be afraid of here's a night light so I'm just saying, you know. My kids were yeah. never afraid of the dark until they learned it on TV. I'm not even yeah. kidding. Like, they watched a show really? and they talked about, like on Superwire or something, how the kids were scared of the dark. And the show was all about how you shouldn't be scared of the dark, but that planted the seed that they should yeah. originally be scared of the dark. And I was so right. annoyed by that because they would have yeah. been scared of the dark. Good. Good. I, I got to ask you. That. That. Yeah. I no, I gotta ask this because Jill and I know each other. We've hung out and we've had fun, fun, and funny <laughs> conversations. And I'm curious, you know, mother to mother, woman to woman here. I know your personality, Jill, but what do you tell your kids when they are start the mommy? I'm scared of the dark. I want to know what you do personal, <laughs> personal curious. Nothing that funny or interesting, actually. <laughs> um, I need help because my kids. I, and my four and a half year old, I don't give in to her for barely anything, but the hallway light on is something yeah, that Yeah, my five I so my three year old doesn't care yet about the light. My daughter in her room, she has a nightlight that's fairly bright. In fact, I kept thinking I should get a, a lower wattage light bulb, but maybe I should try and get rid of it altogether. She also has a clock right next to her bed that when I go and crash in her room, because we're all like musical beds sometimes in the night, mm -hmm. the red uh, pulsing numbers, or pul not pulsing, but the red numbers on that clock are too bright so you're actually making me realize Jenny that I have to move that clock further away because it drives me crazy if it drives me crazy it's probably waking her up but yeah. I am kind of a sucker my husband says I'm a sucker <laughs> like even like the nighttime routine you were talking about before we started the show Jenny we were all chatting about you know how long it should go on for I mean my daughter insists that I lay in bed with her and tickle her tummy or her back until she falls asleep and I can't really and I bet you're thinking the same thing Jill because you're kind of like oh no <laughs> And I, I, and my husband puts them down so quickly, and he's up, and when I have to like go out or something, and I'm like, how do you do it? He said, it's because you're a sucker. You lay with her, you tickle her back, you indulge her. But then I also think she's five, and in six years, she's not gonna even want me to be doing that. So part of me is like, I got through the initial sleep training when they were babies. They they sleep 12 hours. They know how to put themselves to sleep. Mm -hmm. But part of me feels like this is such a short time, and Jenny, you obviously have older kids, so you probably can relate to those years going by so fast. They do know. go by fast, yeah, they do. Jill's a sucker. We heard it here. Jill's a sucker on this level. A lot of other levels, I'm not. But this case, I can't. I love you. That's. What, are you kidding? I love you. I. <laughs> Jenny, yes, could you, Jenny, could you, as an expert first yeah. and then a mother, please speak to that how we do get, should we let ourselves get suckered in at all in the name of enjoying those moments? How do you balance that? Well, you know, I it, balance is key. You know, you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Sorry for the pun, but, you know, <laughs> uh, I always tell parents, you know, if, if, 
if your child is conditioned over time to think that they need your presence or, or something that you have to do for them in order for them to fall asleep or in order to get back to sleep in the middle of the night between sleep cycles, uh, you know, that's creating sort of a sleep crutch. And they're pretty sensitive to it at these young ages, those little sleep crutches. You know, we, uh, we want to be careful that we're giving them that important skill. It's a true gift to give to your child, the ability to fall asleep independently and to get themselves back to sleep between sleep cycles independently without um, somebody coming in and doing all the work for them. Right. So if you notice it's, it's become something they're dependent upon and it becomes a behavioral issue, if you notice that you know, uh, you're having to come in and do that in the middle of the night multiple times and, and, and all of that, you know, it, could, it could get exhausting for the whole family and sleep therefore becomes fragmented for everyone, which means it's only going to exasperate the situation and everybody's going to develop a sleep deficit deprivation because of it. Sleep deprivation is developed by fragmented sleep. So if we don't learn to get to and from a, between sleep cycles quickly on our own, it takes more time and sleep will be more fragmented and then, you know, we're a hot mess. So we all need to toughen up. No. <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> you initially put them to sleep and you, you give in to all this coddling, right? But when a babysitter's there or my husband's there, they fall asleep fine on their own. So I don't necessarily yeah. know that they can't fall asleep on their own, they just are hitting me in the soft spot. Yeah, kids only do, babies and children only do what works for them if they've learned, you know, I mean, you know, if it works for her to tell you something specific that pulls at your heartstrings, you know, and it's it's something you two enjoy doing, but it's not affecting her sleep otherwise in any other way, then, you know, perfect balance, totally fine, as long as both parties are willing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Advice, I like to glass of wine or not on my patient's level. <laughs> <laughs> it does make a difference. It does, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, we also want to encourage, uh, just a reminder, everyone, please load in your questions on the right side of your screen, screen because even though we're all chatting here on screen, we do want your questions as well. I do want to go to another question right now. A. Pez asks, I have questions about using a sound machine near my baby's crib. I know there's been a lot of recent information regarding audio levels, so how low can it be and still remain effective? Is white noise the best sound option to use, or can I use ocean waves or heartbeats as well? Does it matter what kind of sound I use, Jenny? Well, that is an awesome question, and I find that that's the biggest, uh, most misunderstood area of the sleep environment all you know period uh, white noise there is such a thing as crappy white noise that's counterproductive to sleep and, well, what and is it, that now what now what is the crappy white noise that it we is, know, is it's truly for the same reason uh, you know those in between sleep cycles those light active stages of sleep the last kind of white noise you want to be using is anything with a heartbeat lullabies ocean waves rhythms pulses all those sorts of things are notable distinctive sounds to the brain that will stimulate you that your child all the way awake in those light active stages of sleep. Wow. What you really want to be using is what we call in in, in sleep science pink noise. Uh, it's ambient sound. It's a sound something that conditions the stimulating sounds coming from outside of your child's bedroom window or outside of their bedroom door but that doesn't provide any sort of notable distinctive sounds. Like when the air conditioner comes on at night, you know, you notice it when it first comes on, but after just a few seconds you don't hear it anymore. But it does kind of drown out the sounds around you in the environment a little bit. And that's the only reason why I, you know, I've only gotten behind the MARPAC dome. Um, it's a true uh, sound conditioner, white noise machine. It's actually the official white noise machine of the National Sleep Foundation, of which I'm a member. Um, and it is, you know, something that adults use for, they've been using for their sleep for years. But it's just this little... It, and it's a true fan in what looks like this, you know, sort of like a fat smoke detector. It's very portable. It's light. Um, and it's, it's true air that comes out of it. It's not a pre-recorded looping sound like many of the others out there. And, um, you know, so therefore there's no high-pitched, tinny, pre-recorded looping sounds. Um, and you can adjust the airflow and the sound and the tone of the air by just twisting the top of it here. Um, I absolutely love this machine. And in fact, you can keep it at safe decibel levels for your baby's hearing by just uh, placing it further away in the room. That particular study you're speaking of came out last year, um, about this time, and uh, it noted that um, you know in order to make sure that it's safe for your baby's hearing, place it at least 200 centimeters or five and a half feet away from your baby's head. And the neat thing about the MARPAC dome, because it's not a pre-recorded looping sound, the further you place it away from your baby in the room, the better it works. So you really don't have that concern with, um, you know, the 
the hearing issue with this particular um, sound conditioner. So I, I highly recommend it. Interesting. Jen, uh, uh, Jenica, I'm machine. curious. Yeah, <laughs> Jenica, I'm curious. Did you need a sound? Did you have you used a sound um, machine since your baby? It was maybe? really hard to sleep train Noah. It was like we tried like five mm -hmm. times before he was seven months old. It never worked. And so I was trying because I kept trying to find the right sound machine, and I just like wanted him to have one because our noise. We were in a small apartment, and we would wake him up all the time. And I could not find the right one because they all sounded so crappy. And then I like. So I kind of just like gave up and uh, just was like, okay, he'll just learn to sleep on his own. But then at seven months when he like, I finally found a sound machine that I thought would work and it's the ocean waves, but it was like the, I don't know, it was one that I actually found soothing for myself and it was like working for him. But now I'm like, oh, shoot, it was that bad? Because <laughs> now we got a wave sound well. machine and not. I always say too, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, if it's working okay. for your unique child, you know. But you know, bottom line, we, these are just the things we know from sleep right. science and and what I've used for you know with thousands of kids over the years when when sleep training. Yeah. White noise. It excuse me, pink noise is better well, than white noise. Yeah, you know, pink noise really is the thing that just says. I've never you know, heard that term before. That's I why I thought it was so. But I like it. I get soft. it. I understand yeah. it completely. I have a fan on all night. Always have. Yeah. Since I was yeah. a kid, like that's just it's a it's a solid. What, what's the word I'm looking for? More it's coffee. Consistent. <laughs> consistent. <laughs> yes. Yes. Like we'll all do. Like this. One, two, three. <laughs> right? Is that it? That's, that's it. That it. That's exactly what I'm doing. Now I'm going to bed. We did it. We did it. <laughs> uh, Jill, I actually speaking of going to bed, I got a qu I got a question from you right here. I have a, this, well, hello, you're here. Why am I asking the question? But Jill Cordes writes in, I have a friend who puts her 10-month-old to bed at 6 p.m., and it sucks because she can't come over and hang out because her 5-year-old is your daughter's friend. Uh, you, want, you, you ask her, will her baby shift her time? Right. Um, so I'm, yeah, Jenny, how do you deal with this? Like she, does, she, she talked to a sleep expert. I actually, I don't know if it was you yeah. or not, but, um, but, she went through all this sleep training, hoopla, trying to get her to, and, and then finally, like, she just can't push the, like, the baby takes a nap and then is awake and melts down if she doesn't get her to sleep by 6 at night. Like, it, and she sleeps now 12 hours. But I'm like, this sucks because her day ends. <laughs> like, we can't have our wine. We can't have our You just want wine. Hello. You just want wine. That was the biggest change for our family, like me and my husband, because we were the like one of the first out of friends to have a child, and they didn't understand. Like, they're like, oh, let's go to dinner. And it was like 7 right. o'clock. And I'm like, yeah. my kid needs to go to bed, you know? I know. Does your, Jenica, does your baby go to bed super early? Um, 7.30. We should get him ready That's at 7. reasonable. 7.30 7 is like the sweet yeah. spot for me. I, I Okay. Jill, you're right. The six the six p.m. thing. That's a good question. What is it? That seems so early. I mean, six p.m. seems really early. Jenny, what's the? Yeah. the you how know, do you shift the time? Well, you know, as they get older, they can withstand more sleep pressure built up on their brain before they become overtired. But at this young age, 6 p.m. is actually pretty darn close to when we typically see those big, powerful sleep waves wow. ha happen where there's elevated levels of melatonin, and they haven't yet caught their second wind, which really, you know, dissipates melatonin production, and now they're wide awake with, you know, those wakefulness hormones of cortisol and adrenaline. That's why, you know, if you've ever gone out for dinner in L.A. anywhere at 7 o'clock or beyond and there's children anywhere around under the age of three and a half years old, that it's usually, good. yeah, you get dinner and a show. You know <laughs> yeah, what I mean? That's true. So it's, you know, I, because their hormonal levels change. They, they, their sleep cycles lengthen. The ability to withstand a certain amount of sleep pressure starts to increase as they get older. Um, but, you know, we kind of have to have some grace for those mamas. And, you know, it started school. Kickstarter, Kickstarter campaign for your your girlfriends for babysitting funds. You know, so that, <laughs> you know, uh, how long, so the baby's ten months old. How much longer will this melatonin sleep cycle thing last until she can push it till seven o'clock? Well, it all depends. Bedtime is not a set time every night. That's where all the books and the stuff out there is just, you know, it's mm -hmm. ne it should never be a set time for a young child. It's all about the quality of that afternoon nap. 
you know, from the point they wake up from that afternoon nap, and we need to be capping that always by 3 o'clock. We don't want sleep happening for a 10-month-old after 3 because that will surely wreck mm -hmm. their night sleep and those melatonin levels uh, elevating. So, you know, if, if we can stretch and lengthen that nap, um, you know, and lengthen and, and improve the quality of that second nap, from the time mm -hmm. you notice that they wake up from that, they've got about 3 and a half to 4 hours of sleep pressure that they can withstand built up on the brain before they become overtired and that should be their bedtime. So, you know, if the while you're waiting for the quality of that second nap to improve and maybe it's a little, you know, a little early that they're waking up from it, it's going to be a very early bedtime, you know, so, sometimes yeah. some, sometimes 5:45, 6 o'clock, but if you catch that wave and you just do this one time, you're going to see a massive improvement mm -hmm. in the quality. Wow. Of what are life. like the prime the nap wave. times? Catch the prime. wave, yeah. <laughs> what are the prime nap times that a child should have? Because my son has two naps. He has a morning nap and an afternoon nap. But his morning nap is always way shorter than his afternoon nap. And recently now his afternoon nap is like shortening. It used to be two hours, now it's an hour. So you said it shouldn't go longer than three? Well, three hours know, or three o'clock? Three o'clock. Three o'clock. So what time well, should, should it be? Like two to, Like how long should that nap be? Typically that morning nap kids do a little bit, they're, they're fine if they just get one sleep cycle in, which is about 50 to 60 minutes. Mm -hmm. You know, if they catch a good, uh, you know, good nap in the morning like that, that morning nap is the one that's most restorative to the brain. You know, and then the afternoon nap, typically we want to see them sleeping a little bit longer and they probably should because that's going to prevent them from becoming overtired before bedtime. And that's really the goal is to have a well-rested child throughout the day. We don't want them to be exhausted at bedtime because if even if they're totally exhausted and crash, they're crashing with very little melatonin present in their system. And that's what causes the fragmented sleep at night and the extra early in the morning wake ups. So if you want to oh. Yeah. So if you want to cure your five AM the five AM alarm clock that goes off, you know, in you know, in his little body, the key is to get him to bed earlier, not later. So with the afternoon nap, um, should they be, like, what time should their afternoon nap be, like, roughly? Because he was going down at 2, but sleeping until, like, 4. Uh, yeah. Well, we know um, through, take, you know, EEGs and, and saliva tests and core, you know, testing core body temperatures, we know that when core body temperatures drop, melatonin levels rise. And with little ones this age, uh, you know, sleep science and studies have kind of noticed that 1 o'clock is the sweet spot. So we really, I, I do not, when I work with a family, I, I try to make sure that the child is down by one, not a minute later. And then, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if they want to sleep till three o'clock, they can. You just have to cap mm -hmm. it at three o'clock. But ultimately, we, we, we do want a full hour under their belt of sleep um, because that's, you know, that's the, they'll receive, receive the restorative qualities of that second nap if they get a full sleep cycle in. But, you know, if, if we're really working aggressively with that nap, we can, you know, lengthen and stretch in that to, um, you know, one and a half or two sleep cycles, and that's ideal for them. Does that apply to a three-year-old, too? <laughs> yes. Uh, every, you know, children under three and a half, um, basically, you know, five to six months of age to three and a half, I'll keep this 1, 8, 1 p.m. nap. This is the okay. one that's most restorative I to could the body. Go, I could go for a 1 p.m. nap myself. <laughs> <laughs> you do. You sleep in your car. <laughs> yes. Yes. Hello. Yes. I've seen it. We do go to lunch. Really? And then she does. We go to sleep in the car. <laughs> oh, my that's God. another. That's another blog now. Yeah, I, <laughs> I do want to. I love this conversation, but I do want to go to a question that we have because Olivia Dorman, you have been. So patient, and but you have your question here, and I see it on the screen. I'm going to go to it right now. Olivia asks, "How do I wean my six-month-old off of being swaddled? He sleeps so well with it, but he is starting to rock himself to sleep, and I'm afraid he's going to roll over in that swaddle and get into yeah. trouble." Jenny June, I wasn't aware that swaddling would still be happening with a six-month-old. Should month will still be swaddled at all. Well, you know, we have a tendency as moms to do, to try and continue holding on to what worked for us in that first stage yeah. of infancy as long as possible. You know, change is not comfortable for any of us. Um, the child at about four months of age goes through a huge, you know, cognitive brain surge and, and everything is now about the brain instead of the physical vitals. So we, we need to evolve our parenting response to meet the evolving development of our child. And, you know, now they're starting to roll and rock and all those, you know, scoot around and stuff. We need to lose the swaddle at that point and transition them to a wearable blanket. You know, um, it's just uh, important that we 
um, you know, provide safety for them in these in these situations. And yeah, it's going to seem like it gets a little worse before it gets better, but you're allowing them essentially to use their hands and their arms to learn self-soothing skills, bring them up to their face. You know, some babies like to tug a little on their hair. Some mm -hmm. of them really find it soothing to move around in the crib and, and uh, you know, kind of po poke their legs through slats and different things. That's what they need to learn and discover about themselves. They use that to initially help themselves fall asleep and get back to sleep. So I'm a wanna... huge fan of the sleep sack. Jenica, I don't know if you use the sleep yeah, sack. I, I used did. it until Emmett sack. was like two and a half because he couldn't take his legs <laughs> over the crib and get out. People mm -hmm. couldn't, I was still using it. I would buy extra, extra large. But, um, <laughs> you know, Jennifer, you're probably in that window of the yeah. Baby. Okay, well, Noah was not a swaddler. He hated. He always he needed his hands up by his face. Yeah. Like since the minute he came out, he never liked swaddling because it woke him up because he was trying to get his arms out. So right. we never we didn't swaddle. We swaddled like his lower half, but left his hands out. Yeah. So I can't I can't like That's totally swaddle. relate yeah, to yeah. swaddling for a long time. And then when we did the sleep sack, we did the like the tank top kind that his right, arms yeah. come through. Right. And exactly. then. He just moves all night long. Like he's, he like I think he hits every wall and corner of his crib during the night. <laughs> yeah. So we kind of just yeah. dropped the sleep sack because he couldn't move around. Yeah, and, and you know, fall and, like soothe himself back to sleep. So I'm like, okay, we'll just get rid of that, and he can keep learning to soothe himself. Yeah, so. and you know, to going back to Olivia's question, which I thought was really good because I, I hear this a lot with you know that transition be around six, you know, four to six months with that. It'll help um, Olivia feel a lot more, um, you know, give her some peace of mind if she's if she's got her baby monitor in a in a great position yeah. where she, you know, when once you transition the baby out of that swaddle and they're yeah. they're in a sleep sack or wearable blanket of some kind, you know, and they're moving all over the crib. Sometimes we don't get a really good view when you know if our baby monitor is not positioned. Well, um, mm -hmm. you know, so you know, I tell parents uh, you're going to feel a lot better if you can see them completely, and 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 I often recommend the View See this universal baby monitor shelf. This thing's amazing, um, you know, really inexpensive. It's probably one of the best safety tools that you can get for your baby's nursery. It's just a, you know, a little shelf that goes in the corner of the room, and the in the of the wall. Mm -hmm. It's it's. It angles down at a 40 percent or at a 40 degree angle, and it has just a little latch here that you, you, any baby monitor, um, especially in the Motorola baby monitor, just goes right on there, and uh, and it's so it's angled down so that you have a perfect view, bird's eye view of the entire surface of the crib. So no matter where your baby rolls around in that thing, you can always see him, and and that makes parents feel good. And it's just got some oh, yeah. you know, removable. Um, you know, those 3M command awesome strips that don't do any damage to the wall, so you can, you know, remove it and take it with you to hotel rooms and things like that. It's pretty cool. Right. But um, the View C, I highly recommend. That's going to give you a lot of peace of mind, along with yeah. using your baby monitor. I you know, was glued. I was glued to my baby monitor. Oh, I have moms that <laughs> go to much. consultations, and they're curled up in the fetal position with that baby <laughs> monitor. You know, like... <laughs> uh, it's so cute, but my, the Motorola is definitely one of my favorites. It, you know, there's so many um, cool features about that, and even with regards to keeping the temperature of the room, you know, in a safe at a safe level for baby to sleep well. It, that's one of the few monitors on the market that actually um, tells you on the monitor the ba the temperature of the room and notifies you um, if it changes, which is awesome. You don't have to go in the room and fragment your kid's sleep checking the you know the thermometer. So it's pretty cool, and it, that'll give her a lot of peace of mind. Uh, Olivia, that was a great question. Thank you. Well, you want to know, you're talking about awesome. You want to know what else is totally awesome? That's what we're giving away today. That's right. <laughs> the Motorola Digital Baby Monitor. That is the big giveaway today. So surprise! <laughs> uh, I just like scared everyone close up. Not close up. Surprise! Yeah. Uh, we, we're giving away the Motorola Digital Baby Monitor. The thing's got Wi-Fi. Jenny, you said, you know, you... You listed a bunch of uh, features. It does keep the temperature of the room. Um, mm -hmm. I just said it has Wi-Fi. We're going to be giving that away, mm -hmm. big ticket item, at the end of this show. And uh, you're going to want to stay tuned for the end of the show because there is a fun and fabulous little trivia question that you're going to get to answer to try and win that Motorola Digital Baby Monitor. So stay tuned for that. But um, speaking of monitors, I get, I, Jenny, here's a personal question. Mm -hmm. I'm getting personal with you. Okay. So I mentioned my girl. Here we go. This is free. I'm taking advantage of this too. So okay, guys, like, let's just be clear. Uh, my daughters are four and a half and three. As of three days ago, everyone is in a bed. I just took my three-year-old's crib away. It went to Babyland. We now have a bed. 
so far, knock wood, everyone's great. However, sleep environment is not ideal because it is a an all night slumber party. It, not all night. I would say we have like a two hour slumber party situation happening from the time <laughs> I actually turn out the lights and put everyone to bed. There's yelling, there's giggling, there's talking, there's squealing. I hear back and forth. I go into the room how many times? Get in bed, go to sleep. I try not to talk. <laughs> For two then, hours? Uh, almost two so hours. Time, almost. Like nine, ten? I put them, I put my girls to bed. I shoot for like 7.45, 8 o'clock. Me too, okay. And then, uh, and it usually, you know, some nights are later, but you know how that goes. Mm -hmm. But uh, usually, on average, it's 7.45, 8 o'clock, and I have been employing the 30-minute pre-routine, like you said in the last episode, but they are giggly, chatty girls, and then my three-year-olds will go and take <laughs> all of the stuffed animals in their room <laughs> and pile them in the bed, and then there's a picnic in the beds oh with the stuffed God. animals. That is not an ideal sleep environment. What do I do? Do I have to take all the toys out of the room every night? Oh, God. I mean, what, Jenny? I use them. Um, well, all right. Well, I can, I can completely relate with this because, you know, my, my three older children are girls, you know, and they were born, you know, all four of them were born within six years. Wow. And, you know, there was a time when I had to rack them and stack them all in one room. <laughs> and, and, and actually, and when I was a single mom for eight years, you know, and, and you know, single broke mom, you know, I mean, we had a small place and we had to put them all in the same room even when they were teenagers. We still had the same issues. But bottom yeah. line, the way to resolve this situation. It's not impossible. Uh, make the room as boring as possible oh. um, for sleep. And, and, and really, something as simple as just keeping it super dark in the room. Then they can't see to have their little sorority party or pull off the shenanigans, you know? So uh, that could be helpful. I tell parents, you know, with that sleep environment, you know, if you can't, if you don't want to invest in, in expensive blackout drapes, blast out the black plastic garbage bags and a little duct tape and you know, go right to the window with it and tape it off. I mean, yeah, you can even get like those a, temporary blackout ones from Amazon that stick on. Yeah, yeah you know, I mean, expensive. That's nice. Black plastic garbage bags are cheap. They're readily available. Yeah, you'll look like a crack house from the outside. But everybody's <laughs> gonna be sleeping good. So. <laughs> Does the blackout apply for the like, nap time? Because I'm wondering yes. if my son's waking up because it's too bright. But I was like, maybe he'll just get used to the light and know it's like a nap and not like nighttime sleep so he doesn't sleep all day. I don't know. I was I wasn't sure what to do. Yeah, no, Jenica, that's like a that's a really common um, you know thought from a lot of parents. They're like, well, I want them to know the difference between a nap and night sleep, so we want to keep light in the room and da da da. da. And you know, ultimately, it's just you know melatonin levels can't elevate if if we're in a place that's you know lit up. You know, if there's right. lights on in the room, or you know if it's if it's lighter, it's just going to make it more challenging for them, especially at nap time, because our babies are social creatures. They want to stay up and party with us. You know, mm -hmm. they you know, and they don't realize the reason why they're so miserable. Is because they're sleep right. deprived. So you know, if we're doing everything we can to set them up for success, you know, bringing them into that cool, dark, white noise-filled nursery we've just created for them, you know, providing the pre-sleep routine in there so that we give melatonin and those powerful sleep hormones time to kickstart and elevate. Then the brain and the body want to do the sleeping, and the only thing left to fight it then might be their will or you know, knowing that there's something interesting going on outside the bedroom. But it's going to be harder for them to fight the nap if the room yeah. is nice and dark. Okay. Dark, dark. What about dark. Like, I mean, dark. like of, of, oh. again, like a three and a five year old. Um, like Jill, you you. Sounds like you put your kids to bed about the same time I do. My three-year-old will he they they they're supposed to sleep in separate rooms, but lately they've been together. But it's actually been <laughs> a little easier because if they're together, then I don't have to lie with them and do that whole thing that I explained earlier. So, and, and my daughter's usually pretty tired because she doesn't nap anymore, so she goes to sleep pretty quick, and then he'll eventually follow suit. But no matter what, if I put them to bed at seven or at nine. My daughter, at least, she's five, is always up at like 6.15. It doesn't matter where I put her to sleep on the, That's in the not evening. That's my son. He's asleep at 7 a.m. no matter what. Even time change, like we can be like two hours behind or ahead or whatever. Yeah. It's 7 o'clock. So what is that in the cycle? Like what's going on? That's true. Is, yeah. Is it six or any way to change the wake up? Yeah. 
Yeah, so the, are you talking about they're up between somewhere between 6 and 7 a.m. in the morning? Is that what you're saying? Oh, well, that's the ideal. That's the natural biological wake time for, a, you know, But a even if they don't age. go to sleep until like 9 sometimes, like some nights it's later, some nights it's earlier, but that's just their body? That's just it? Our internal sleep clock is designed to go off at that time unless we're conditioning it to do so otherwise. If we're responding to a 5 a.m. wake up, like, you know, and, and setting the internal sleep, we set the internal sleep clock to go off at that time every morning. But if we allow them to remain in the time and space for sleep until that natural biological wake time of 6 to 7, that's ideal. Then you want to get them out. I mean, that's really where you've got, you've got a really, um, you know, a you could typically tell if a child's well rested if they're willing if they're getting up between that time frame. Okay. It's when we see something waking prior to 6 a.m. or uh, after 7 a.m. that we kind of look at well maybe there's a possibility of sleep deprivation going on. Wow. So you're in good shape. Yeah. Good, well, what if they wake shape. up like my three-year-old lately has been waking up at five, wa wanting me? I get in bed with him. That's just the last three mornings because I'm so tired, and then he falls asleep until like 7.15. Is that that three-minute in-between melatonin cycle that he's kind of waking up, but instead of going back to sleep, he's crawling for me? And do I tell him no? Do I go in and say, you got to go back to sleep by yourself? Well, there's two reasons why a child is typically waking at that, you know, prior to their natural biological wake time of at least 6 a.m. Um, one is they're usually going to bed later and they're missing that sleep wave, so there's not enough of those powerful sleep hormones present to get them into the deeper, more restorative stages of sleep where they sleep to their natural wake-up time. So dial bedtime back earlier if you have a child that's waking up early. It's counterintuitive to our adult mm -hmm. sleep logic, but mm -hmm. it's magical stuff. Yeah, and then the other reason... <laughs> Yeah, and then the other reason that we see wake-ups between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., you know, especially around that 5 a.m. point, is because those particular sleep cycles, the architecture of those sleep cycles, has more components of active light stages of sleep um, than earlier in the night. So, you know, it's a little bit more work for them to connect those sleep cycles. So sometimes they do arouse all the way awake, um, and, and they, it takes a little work, you know, just like it does for us to get back to sleep, but that's okay. always their goal. But if you're going in and for any reason to try and do the work for them, then really what that does is it, it programs and sets that internal sleep clock to go off at that time every morning. And then all of a sudden it starts getting earlier and earlier. So should so, I just tell him, like, tonight, look, if you wake up in the night, mommy's not coming in? You know, there's a lot of really neat things that you can do to prepare them in advance and give them the skills to do that. You know, you know, obviously we don't have time for an hour-long consultation on that, you know, one component. But, you know, there's some, with that age, at three years old, there's a lot that you can do to kind of help him learn your family sleep manners. And this is how we sleep. You know, this is how we get ourselves back to sleep. And, mm -hmm. and I'm going to help you at a certain point once you have these tools and once we role play and practice and, and talk about it, okay. I'm going to give you, uh, I'm going to respond to you by getting out of your way so that Ooh. you can do the sleeping. Ooh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're going to be a big boy, a big girl <laughs> now. Oh, the psychology. Jenny, see, sleep diva, sleep diva. Jenny, I do have a question from one of our uh, viewers here. Uh, Anna, and it is, I think, very applicable to sleep environment as we're talking about today. Anna Jess asks, what can you do for a baby that gets scared while sleeping? Does that ha does sleep environment play a factor in that? Yeah. Like a night terror? Night terror. I'm just, yeah, it just says get scared while sleeping. I'm going to guess that's maybe a nightmare and night terror question. Yeah. Okay, so night terrors and nightmares are two different things, and we can kind of tell the difference between the two as, you know, the, the first tell sign is what time of night it's happening. Typic typically, if it's um, happening from sleep onset when you put them to bed to somewhere before midnight, that's a night terror. Babies do not realize that they're having them when, they're ha when, when an episode is happening. It, sound, it sounds super dramatic, and you'll hear crazy screaming, and it just sounds, you know, it's scary, way more scary for the person witnessing one or hearing it, uh, typically the parent or a sibling that shares a room with them, than, than, and the child has no idea they're doing it, and they don't remember it when they wake up from it. Um, the best thing to do is just, you know, you know, lay a hand on them or go in or or stay out of their way and just let them get through it and get back to sleep. Um, typically, they don't wake up from them, um, and they don't. And the last thing you want to do is discuss it in the morning. Mm. Um, but you know, with babies though, uh, in, in usually the best treatment for that is is earlier bedtimes. Uh, it's a sleep hygiene issue that creates night terrors, and there's no way to correct 
night terrors without sleep hygiene um, being implemented. There's all kinds of tools and craziness out there that you know try to do the work for you, but ultimately it really comes down to sleep hygiene. Um, nightmares don't happen with babies until they're a little bit older. And so when, it, when we talk about when moms say oh, my baby is scared, oftentimes I ask a lot of powerful questions and find out that these are sometimes just um, <clears throat> a parent's own anxieties that are being personified onto the child. We just, you know, we do it to our pets too. You know, we think our, you know, I mean, we personify feelings and anxieties onto our pets or our children sometimes. And really they're just kind of issues that we've dealt with ourselves or that we're dealing with currently. And we have to be kind of careful and mindful to check those because scientifically babies really, you know, we have no no way of knowing that. And if we assume that they're scared and respond that way, then we create little victims and we, we're constantly getting in the way of, of something like a health and safety issue like sleep. What age do babies start to have night or kids start to have nightmares, not night terrors, nightmares? You'll notice it around somewhere around two and a half, three, uh, four, that area. <clears throat> and it usually starts to, you know, to... Um, you know, peak and, and, you know, it can get better or worse, um, you know, and then you'll see a, a bit of a difference at age seven. It sometimes gets better at that point. Um, but it also happens after midnight. Um, and you'll notice the child arouses all the way awake and will get up out of sleep and maybe come into your room and, and you know, and tell you they've, you know, sometimes it's just that they've, you know, for instance, if they're conditioned to fall asleep to somebody laying next to them, and then they wake up in the middle of the night and they need, you know, that same thing. They think they need that same thing in order to get back to sleep between sleep cycles. If they know that using the word nightmare or I'm, a, I'm afraid or I'm scared if to get into your bed and, and, you know, and get that sleep crutch or bring you into the room, sure they're going to use it because kids only do what works for them. So it's kind of hard. You have to be kind of discerning about really determining, you know, and your mother's heart will know that. Mm-hmm. Uh, great questions. The night, I had no idea about the night terrors, by the way. Uh, here's a question from APES, and I want to ask everybody that, first of all, I guess, let me ask you this survey. How many, my, me included, raise your hand if you've ever thought about uh, hackers hacking into your video monitor and watching yes. you in your home. Yes. Yes, that's why I didn't world. get. I didn't get a Wi-Fi monitor for that reason. I was like, all I want is just the video that just sits there and watches, and I just have the little monitor that and I don't have to worry about Wi-Fi and things like that because that yeah. made me nervous. Yeah, right. yeah. That, that's what. That was the question. That had, APES has a concern about the safety of video monitors. She's concerned that hackers might be able to intercept the video streams into the child's nursery. Um, Jenny, do you have any insight about this? Yeah, you know, um, baby monitor manufacturers, Motorola especially, mm -hmm. took uh, took note of that a few years ago when we noticed, you know, that on on the internet. And I spoke with them at some of the, um, you know, the big you know, product shows and things that I go to and, and had a wonderful conversation with them and uh, they had made some wonderful changes. You know, ultimately, in order for somebody to hack into your baby monitor, they have to have your um, your password, they have to download, uh, you know, the specific app for your baby monitor and, you know, and, and the, what, the Motorola provides an option of whether or not you even want to, you know, if you even want to use the Wi-Fi component, you don't have to. Um, and, you know, so it's kind of, there's more safeguards in place now, so you don't have to be m as concerned about it. And you do have the option with the Motorola to have the Wi-Fi connected to your, your baby monitor or not. Okay. Well, that made me feel a little bit better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> me too. A lot better, actually. Yeah. A lot better. Because it's like you never know. It's like you're trying to balance all these things. And the more news stories you hear, we all know this, the more freaked out everyone gets. And then, you know, it makes you invite the baby into your bed. And then we find ourselves asking Jenny June all these questions. And then we find <laughs> these parents coming from. So thank you for that. Um, last question. Uh, I, last question from, let's, ooh, excuse me, as I look at the thing, uh, Linz, Linz Shea, I don't know, Lindsay, Linz Shea, I'm going, I, that's your YouTube name, so I'm going to ask you a question. I've always been hesitant to use the sound machines because I worry about having, I worry about having, uh, excuse me, let me, I worry about having break them, is it later if they'll have troubles? Oh, I see. Maybe she's she's see. We're break I'm trying them. to see. She's, yeah, she's worried if the sound machines are going to break 
And if, uh, oh, she's worried if she's going to use okay, a sound machine, the kid's going to get used to the sound machine, and then the sound machine is going to break, and then the kid's not going to be able to sleep. I think that's your question, Lindsay, and yeah. I hope I got it right. Have you seen this problem where a child gets addicted to a sound machine and then can't put themselves to sleep without it? Jenny. I totally understand her question. I get asked this by my clients mm -hmm. all the time. If we if we get our baby used to sleeping with a sound conditioner or whatever, how do we break them of it later on? I mean, is it something that they have to have until they're, you know, 40 then or whatever? Right. You know, or, you know mm -hmm. it's there are some great, um, you know, great tools that we need to really think about implementing into our children, child sleep to protect their sleep. Um, the neat thing I've noticed is that children, once they become well rested and their internal body clock and, and their sleep is synced with their natural biological rhythms, with good sleep hygiene and the skills to get from one sleep cycle to the next, then we have a well rested child who is able to sleep in all kinds of conditions um, because they're and they and they know how to protect their sleep on their own even at young ages I've got um, clients who have sent me pictures of a, of their children crawling into the bottom of the stroller to take a nap at the zoo you know um, just to get it a little dark you know? <laughs> was it dark enough that's what I wanted yeah. to say was it dark <laughs> And then they go in the reptile cave. That's awesome. <laughs> when we have families that travel and all of that, you know, the child just learns to, they have better sleep skills. And a more well-rested child whose sleep is protected 90% of the time with a solid sleep environment will always be more adaptable and easy and, um, you know, and, and guard their own sleep to some degree, sleep better when, when life throws, you know, interesting scenarios at you where you can't, you don't have the sleep environment available. So I've, I've seen nothing but positive things from that. You, you know, a lot of my, my families, the, the adults start buying these machines for themselves. Um, well, you can have, there's apps now, you can just have your phone next to you charged. With yeah, the, the, yeah. I do that sometimes on the road. Like that might right. be something for your viewers if you don't want to lug your sound machine with you. You know, there's <laughs> simple apps and, and you can scroll right. through and find the one that's this constant noise. Right. Um, well, was, I sent I sent I sent the dome. This has been around since the late sixties. I sent I sent my my twenty one year old when she went off to college. You know, I sent my uh, dome with her, her dome with her, so that she could study it without hearing all the oh, shenanigans going on around her. You know, sometimes when we live in these urban cities and loud environments where helicopters are going by and the, the loud party animal neighborhoods, you know, neighbors, you know, and all the stuff, we live in a loud world right now. There's constant noise and constant distraction. I think it's wonderful to have a tool that really helps us get centered, peaceful, drown out like all the noise and and focus it's it's a it's a, it's a health and safety tool in my mind I myself will be googling Marpac dome yeah. pink noise when oh, we get on really? the um, I do want to I do want to get to as promised we are giving away the drum roll please dun, da, 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 Motorola digital baby monitor with Wi-Fi and now now's the moment people here is the question coming at you uh, first some rules you do have to be a subscriber to baby league in order to win this prize so if you're not already a baby league subscriber just click the mm -hmm. subscribe button below and um, I hope you brushed up on your mommy and me uh, episode <laughs> trivia because here's the question in order to win the Wi-Fi, Motorola, baby monitor, here's the question. It's from our last show on Sleep Routine, which of course features the talents of Jenny Jim. Here's the question. How long should the pre-sleep routine for bedtime last? Nobody answer, except if you're entering to win the Motorola Wi-Fi baby monitor. How long should the pre-sleep routine for bedtime last? Go ahead and enter the answer into uh, into the comments section and uh, the first person to answer that question correctly that does live in the United States is going to win that baby monitor so ooh, I'm very excited about this I'm starting to look yeah. I'm starting to look um, I probably don't have access to the actual answers we're gonna have our moderator tell us who entered the answer but um, that's that's an exciting that's a big ticket item that's a big yeah. win. Um, and once again just as we discussed in terms of um, you know the Wi-Fi video monitors everything is very very safeguarded these days when it comes to mm -hmm. using a Wi-Fi baby monitor and to tell you the truth I kind of wish I still had a baby monitor in my girls room I know. Yeah. I really their midnight tea parties I know it's like yeah 
It feel, I feel like every single person, when I gave up my baby monitor personally, every single person told me, no, keep it in there through, the, you know, through when they're yeah. toddlers. That way you can see what they're doing. Definitely. Um, is that, yeah, I, would, I would have kept mine. Mine eventually broke. It wasn't Motorola. Um, <laughs> actually, it recently broke, and I was bummed because I don't really need to buy another one, but it was like, oh, man, I liked watching what was yeah. going on. It yeah. is, and it just gives you, you know, like just a little added intel. Like, uh -huh. This is a silly question, okay. but is the Wi-Fi monitor cordless? Yes. So, Well, that's the, a big deal now, right, with the cords, and you want to keep the cords away from the crib. And yeah, that's you know. a good point. Right, and that's why we want to have a VUC monitor shelf to keep those baby cords from being within arm's reach. You know, if a baby stands up or scoots through and puts the arm through the crib slats, we don't want them right. grabbing that cord and accidentally strangling. So that's why, you know, VUC baby monitor shelf is a great safety tool. But these are, um, you know, the, the component that you're going to be watching your baby on, this big, huge... 4.3 inch screen, um, that's cordless. You carry it around your house with you. It has a huge range and will let you know if you're out of range. And then my favorite thing is that, you know, with the Wi Fi option that you have with this, um, it's very easy to hook up. You can literally, when you go out, uh, have a babysitter and go out to dinner, you know, anywhere. I mean, long distances travel, you know, you can be in another state and you can watch what? what's happening. Yes. You can watch what's happening. If that is good intel. I tell moms, get <laughs> order order an extra. Uh, it's actually camera. almost worth getting it, even with a three and a five year old. It totally is. Order an extra camera. They offer that. That's an additional option you can order and put it in different places of the house. It's like you can monitor what your babysitter's doing and what. But how do you, you see? Know. Like, is it an app then that you put? Do you see far from far away, like at a restaurant? Yeah, it's you just download the Hubble app that that connects oh. to to this, and and you can see it on your smartphone, your tablet, your laptop mm -hmm. computer. Um, oh. At work, you can be That's like so log cool. in and see how your baby's sleeping that afternoon, and then you know, and 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 how your your babysitter or your caregiver is handling the nap time routines and all of that. You can watch it all. Wow! Wow! wow. Part, yeah. of mother, part of motherhood <laughs> is spying, you know, and we do that. <laughs> We do. It's all of mother. All of motherhood is spying, right? That's um, right. <laughs> her. Yay. Okay, so before I want to quiz it. So, uh, Jill and Jenica, do you happen to remember what the pre-sleep bedtime routine time limit should be? Do any of you remember? If you do, yell it out. I yes. did. It was 30 minutes. Oh, yeah. I mean, 30 Woo! Minutes. Yes, the answer. The answer. Your pre-sleep baby. Uh, excuse me. Your pre bedtime sleep routine should last no more than 20 to 30 minutes. That's the correct answer. And the winner is Olivia Dorman. Yay! Yay! You won. Olivia Dorman, you won the Motorola uh, Wi-Fi baby monitor. Baby monitor. So, yes, congratulations. We're all envious, uh, for the record. What, yes. <laughs> what we need you to do is... Uh, please, Olivia, this is important. In order to get this, we need you to direct message Baby League here on YouTube with your contact information. Uh, so Olivia, direct baby, excuse me, direct message Baby League through YouTube with your contact information, and we're going to get you that Motorola baby monitor. Congratulations! Yay. Maybe we'll all come to your house and have a baby monitor party. Just right? <laughs> Wait, is the bedtime routine yeah. brushing teeth and all that, or is it from the time you get in bed to read books, the 30 minutes? It's the point from which you take them into the, the bathroom to begin the bath and all the uh -huh. stuff. From oh, the point, wow. that point till when you lay them down in their bed or crib to sleep. Okay. It's 20 to 30 yes. minutes max. Jill, you need to watch that episode, Sleep Routine. I left episode. Yeah. How <laughs> are the people drinking wine with it? It's a good thing, thing I didn't. It was that. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Listen, everybody, we're nearing towards the end of our one hour here. And uh, quickly, this has been a great conversation. We want it. At, I've had so much fun with you ladies. The Thank Jay you. Show. Great. Jenny, Jill, Jenica, me, Jill. <laughs> and then we also, obviously, we want to we want to thank uh, everyone who submitted comments. We love having conversations with you. We love bringing up new topics and learning new things. Also, we definitely want to thank the sponsors who brought you this episode. Uh, VUC. Marpac, especially the Dome product, the Marpac Dome, and uh, of course the uh, big giveaway, big ticket giveaway from Motorola, their digital baby monitor. We thank you, VUC, Marpac, and Motorola for uh, lending us your expertise and voice in this conversation. And really quickly for the last minute, I want to I want each panelist to tell us, just once again, reminder, who you are and where everyone can find you to, to follow you and get more information and fun. So Jenny, June, tell us where everyone can find you. 
Well, you can find me on my website, JennyJune.com, and that's Jenny spelled with just an I on the end of it, uh, J-E-N-N-I, June is in the month, dot com, or 1-800-322-4116. I work with families all over the country and all over the world, not just here in Los Angeles where I live, uh, so we'd be happy to, uh, you know, to help you with your child's sleep um, in my consulting business. Very good. Jill, tell us where you are. Uh, the best way is my website, which is jillcordes.com, J-I-L-L-C-O-R-D-E-S. I also have, like, a component that's Fearly, Fearless Feisty Mama, which is my blog that will redirect you back and forth, but I haven't updated the blog in a long time. We, we don't all, you're good, girl. You don't need to, you don't need to follow you anyways. Your, your Twitter is Fearless Mama. Fearless Mama. Yeah. Okay. All right. And uh, Jenica. Yeah, um, on just my daily vlog, Samika Vlogs on YouTube, S-A-M-I-K-A, -A, um, and then just social media platforms, I'm just Jenica Ray. Um, yeah, that's very, very cool. Me. Very cool. <laughs> I'm Jill Simonian. You guys all know me. My website is thefabmom.com, trying to stay focused, fun, and as close to fabulous as possible after <laughs> <laughs> So it sometimes gets a little frank and loony over there, but yeah, <laughs> but that's where you can find me. Um, and then once again, we want to remind you, we are doing these Mommy and Me live shows uh, pretty much every other Saturday. So our next show is going to be, I believe it's um, after Mother's Day. My gosh, I, oh, haha, Saturday, May 16th. It's on my paper if I just look at <laughs> Next show's topic is da -dun, da -dun, Mommy and Me Romance After Baby. Ooh, and I'm a little scared. And I'm <laughs> it's going to be Saturday, May 16th. We're going to be talking about romance after baby on the next Mommy and Me Live. And don't forget to subscribe to Baby League yes. because that's where you can find us. I have had so much fun. I think it's time to say goodbye. Yeah. We all have Bye. to give a big fat kiss on the count of three. One, two, three. Mwah. Bye. This was fun. Thank you. Bye. Bye, ladies. Have fun.